Okay. All right. So hello, everyone. And thank you all for being here at the Community Health and Wellness Virtual Fair Domestic Violence 101 Workshop and Panel. Over the next hour and a half, we will first introduce you to our panelists and then share a presentation with you. From there, we will go on to, to a discussion with our panelists, and then we will wrap things up with a Q&A between you, the audience, and the panelists we have here today. Lastly, we will do a, our $25 gift card raffle. You do have to be present um, to be able to win for the raffle. So our intention today is in providing this panel discussion is to provide you information, share up options, calm hearts and minds, offer hope and encouragement, and answer any questions you may have about this topic. So please share any questions that you have for the panelists in our Q&A box that we have. Um, if you would like to say hi, introduce yourself, or have any statements or anything you would like to say to the panelists, you can use our general chat for that. Um, if we're not able to answer your question throughout this event, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at SD Care Center throughout the month, and we'll be offering different um, informational po posts and more services, and we'll try to get to your questions there as well. So as a disclaimer, the information provided in this discussion is for informational purposes only. What will be shared during this time are the professional and personal and professional opinions and views held by the panelists. If you or someone you know are experiencing domestic abuse and need, abuse and need help now, please seek help from a licensed professional, a service provider like some we have on the panel today, or your local authorities. I'll be putting our San Diego County DV crisis hotline in the chat, as well as the National Domestic Violence Hotline in the chat if that's something that you need. So now we will go on to panel introductions. So if our first panelist, Amanda, will start us off. I'm sorry, Amanda, we can't hear you. Well, while, oh, I think. Okay. We still can't hear you, Amanda. I'm sorry. While, while you get that, to get your sound together, we'll just move on to Stephanie and we'll circle back around. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Perez and I work for the Immigration Center for Women and Children, um, or ICWIC. ICWIC is a nonprofit immigration law firm who aims to serve um, immigrants who have been victims of violent crimes. Um, the majority of our clients are domestic violence victims um, and we assist them in obtaining legal status or work authorization or both um, here in the United States. Um, ICWIC has been in San Diego for 10, 12 years now, um, but in California for over 20 years. Um, and we have offices in San Francisco, um, Los Angeles, San Diego, and most recently this past year, we opened an office in Las, Las Vegas. Um, so expanding outside of California. Um, and I'm excited to hear um, from everyone else and you answer your questions as we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then we have Carla. Hi, my name is Carla Andlo. Um, I work for the VA healthcare system here in San Diego, and I am the Intimate Partner Violence uh, Assistance Program Coordinator. Um, our program serves both veterans who are experiencing violence in their relationship, as well as veterans who are using violence in their relationships. Um, the VA is a healthcare provider. It is actually the largest healthcare provider, provider in the United States, but the Intimate Partner Violence Assistance Program is new to the VAs. Uh, it started with a pilot back in 2013, and um, we just in San Diego got our program going two years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have Jenny. 
Hi everyone, I am Detective Jenny Martinson with the San Diego County Sheriff's Department and the Domestic Violence Coordinator for the San Diego, Domest for the San Diego Sheriff's Department. Um, so many titles get tongue-tied on all those names. Um, I'm happy to be here with you guys. I, we do investigations for domestic violence and obviously we've got our patrol officers out there that are working 24-7 to, amongst COVID to stay in line with COVID to provide you guys the service that you need to stay safe. Thank you. And then we have you, uh, Del Quas. Hello. Let me see. Hello, everyone. I'm Del Quas Ahmed. I am a director of License to Freedom. License to Freedom is a community based organization committed to work with the refugee and immigrant communities by providing domestic violence, education, prevention, treatment, and also promote social justice. We are a group of advocates who believe that everyone has a right to live without fear, and every survivors of every refugee and immigrant, survivors of domestic violence and sexual abuse must be able to seek and receive services. Those services should and must be respectful with their language, race, age, disability, so, uh, sexual orientations, and, and religious belief. We've been in services for about 18 years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yadira? Hi, good evening. My name is Yadira Diaz. I'm a victim advocate supervisor with the district attorney's office, victim assistance program. We are here to provide services to victims of crime. We're located in all the courthouses in the county of San Diego, including San Diego Police Department headquarters. And we also have advocates working with the sheriff department. Um, and I've been working and assigned to the family protection division in Central for over seven years where I work with um, victims of domestic violence, child abuse, elder abuse, and also sex crimes. Thank you. Thank you, Adira. Mona? Hi, I'm Mona Friday. I'm with uh, Motivations Enterprises, and I'm also a disabled veteran, a domestic violence survivor, and a two-time breast cancer survivor. The clients that I work with, uh, uh, there is a variety of many different people and I specialize in helping people change behaviors, identify behaviors that aren't uh, helping them. We work with uh, mindfulness, mantra repetition, breathing exercises, 12 step program stuff, um, helping with uh, just educating health and wellness. Um, just trying to tailor programs to fit each individual. So I'm just so happy to be here as your moderator today. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm so sorry, Claudia. I must have scrolled past you. I'm sorry, Claudia. That's okay. Uh, my name is Claudia Grasso. I am, I have been a prosecutor with the district attorney's office for now almost 18 years. Uh, I am in the Family Protection Division, and I have uh, prosecuted cases of domestic violence, elder abuse, child molest, child abuse, uh, animal abuse, internet crimes against children now for almost 15 years. Uh, I also have the privilege of serving as the president of the San Diego Domestic Violence Council. Thank you. And Jessica. Hey everybody, so thrilled to be with you. Uh, my name is Jessica Yaffa and uh, I have a few different hats all having to do with the prevention of and early intervention as well as crisis support surrounding uh, relationship abuse. Uh, I am Claudia's uh, predecessor in that I uh, am the former Domestic Violence Council President for San Diego. I also uh, founded and operate a nonprofit called No Silence, No Violence, which has positioned itself to really be the gap filler, if you will, in San Diego County so that when other agencies, we have so many uh, that do such beautiful work here in San Diego County, and yet there are a lot of restrictions around what they are able to and are unable to provide due to uh, funding restrictions, grant requirements, etc. And so uh, we're an organization that only accepts uh, private donations and small grants as well as foundation money so that we're able to say yes uh, in the ways in which others are forced to say no. So really thrilled um, to be a part of uh, today's uh, event. I also have the pleasure of doing a lot of speaking around the country uh, as it pertains to the prevention of and uh, appropriate intervention of 
domestic violence. Thank you, everyone. And really quickly, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Danielle Fair. I'm a crime prevention specialist with the uh, San Diego District Attorney's Office at the Care Community Center, which is a resource hub in National City servicing the Southeast and South Bay communities. And with that, uh, we will go into our presentation that Jessica has for us today. Wonderful. So I'm going to share my screen here so that those of you that uh, are online with us are able to see uh, what it is that, that I'm going to be referring to. And um, I, I actually have to hop off at 6 o'clock p.m. However, Danielle does have my contact info. So if anybody that's watching has questions for me specifically or would like to be in touch, uh, please feel free uh, to reach out. So I want to just start off by um, acknowledging a couple of things. One being uh, that I too, like Mona, uh, am a survivor of domestic violence. Uh, and the, the reason that I do this work it is in fact um, my own sort of personal desire to ensure that those that I'm coming alongside and working with have an opportunity to feel seen, heard, and supported in a way that I didn't always uh, in my own healing journey. And I got really clear along the way in my own journey that if and when I got to a place where I was able to come alongside those that are hurting uh, or have questions about the relationships that they're in and, and are unsure of uh, if this does constitute domestic violence or what does emotional abuse mean, et cetera, that they would have a safe place to feel uh, not only seen and understood, but also to gain non-biased support without agenda and able to show up just as they are. So that's the work that I have the pleasure of doing today. And um, it feels really important to me anytime I do a presentation like this that I start off by acknowledging that uh, I have walked in these shoes because ultimately what makes me an expert in domestic violence is not the education that I have or the number of years that I've been doing this work. It really is the fact that I have personal experience uh, in this and I'm always happy to, to share and feel honored and grateful to be able to share those parts of myself. So when we talk about domestic violence, I think it's important that we first start out by really talking about what that means. And so we've created an opportunity for each of you to have a pretty sort of broad and yet tangible definition of what constitutes domestic violence. Domestic violence um, is all about the willful intimidation, assault, battery, sexual assault, or other abusive behavior perpetrated by one family member, household member, or intimate partner against another. In most states, including California, the relationship necessary for a charge of domestic assault or abuse does include either a spouse, former spouse, people that are residing together, or those that have within uh, the last year or so resided together, as well as persons who share a common child. And that's, that's important to recognize or acknowledge because often, unfortunately, there are many inst instances of threats, violence, intimidation, coercion, control, etc., that falls outside of an intimate partner relationship. And it can be a little confusing you know, when it's domestic violence versus some other form of abuse. So it felt important that we start there. I do want to highlight here, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on as well, that often when we think about domestic violence, many of us think about black eyes, broken bones, bruises, hospitalizations. And so really important as we start tonight's conversation to acknowledge that emotional abuse, psychological abuse, financial abuse, um, and many other forms of abuse absolutely constitute domestic violence. One of the things that I come across very frequently um, it are people that reach out and say, well, I've never been hit um, or I've never been physically struck and therefore um, I don't really meet the criteria of being able to access support in your organization or it's not that bad because I've never been physically harmed and therefore I don't feel deserving of services or I'm unsure of where I fit. And really important as we start out tonight that we acknowledge that number one, the effects of things like emotional or psychological abuse as well as some of the other kinds of abuse that fall in the continuum of domestic violence not only are deserving of an opportunity for resource, but can certainly be as impactful and scarring as experiences of physical violence. 
So when we talk about domestic violence, I think it's, it's also really important to recognize that we're not just talking about a small group of people being affected. That when we look around our communities, that when we look around our family systems, when we look around our friend groups, the groups of people that we work with, we are always interfacing with folks who either are experiencing or have experienced some form of domestic violence. In fact, those of us that work in this field really consider this to be a public health epidemic, that when we talk about the numbers of people that are experiencing relationship abuse or domestic violence, it's so significant that our belief is really that everybody has a responsibility in showing up around the way in which we become a safe space to talk about and talk with um, those who are experiencing potential abuse because ultimately we know that the likelihood that we're talking with people every day that either are in this or have been in this is really significant. So just to give you some idea of what we're talking about in terms of numbers, every one minute 20 people in the United States alone are victims of intimate partner violence. 20 people every one minute. One in four women will experience domestic violence in her lifetime. And, and that is a statistic that, that is actually ever changing because what we do know is that when it comes to things like emotional abuse or psychological abuse, that the rates are even higher. Um, and so when we, when we think about even just the statistical, statistic alone, if you think about four people in your life that you love and care about who identify as female, we can assume that at least one or more of them are experiencing or have experienced some form of physical abuse. And, and that spans across all age groups, all socioeconomic backgrounds, all religious identification, all colors of skin, all sexual orientations. That when we talk about the ways in which we are affected, there really is no discrimination when it comes to domestic violence around who it is that's affected. And that's, that's another myth that we really work hard to dispel because ultimately we can feel like, well, gosh, this isn't something that I need to be concerned about because domestic violence only happens to people who grow up in abusive homes or people who are in poverty or people that have certain religious beliefs. And what we know statistically speaking is that that's just not true at all. That ultimately people in all of the groups that I've just named and across many, many spans experience domestic violence at very similar rates to those that, that we might think tend to be um, experiencing it at higher rates. When we talk about young people, especially for those of you who either have children um, or maybe are a young person, we know that nearly half of dating college women report, experience, report excuse me, experiencing some form of violent or abusive behavior. 43% of dating college women have experienced or are experiencing some form of violent or abusive dating behavior. So when we talk about the ways in which we're talking with our kids about relationship abuse or um, talking with our kids about healthy relationships, these statistics really speak to why it is that it's so imperative that we begin to have these conversations early on and that we as parents become a safe place really early on to be able to talk about healthy relationships, red flags and warning signs, um, things that maybe our children have questions about surrounding relationships that they feel afraid to talk about or ashamed to share. As we position ourselves to be a safe place for our kiddos to come, the sooner the better, so that ultimately we have an opportunity to really influence the ways in which they're choosing and what they're looking for from the moment that they start considering dating relationships. Lastly, on, on this slide, I think one of the, the most profound statistics that I've come across that I continue to reference is the idea that 70% of women worldwide will experience physical and or sexual abuse by an intimate partner in their lifetime. And if we just sort of sit with that for a minute, that really, that really can take your breath away um, when we think about what that means, not just for our country, um, but globally. Another couple um, statistics that we felt were really important to highlight for the purposes of this evening are the fact that 10 million children are exposed to domestic violence every year in our country. And so again, for those of us that are raising children, for those of us that are planning to raise children, for those of us that maybe are adolescent or young adult, when we think about the ways in which 
kiddos are impacted by witnessing abuse or living in a household where there is abuse. And again, that we're not just talking about physical abuse, right? We're talking about psychological abuse, emotional abuse, a lot of yelling, screaming, threatening behavior, using coercion, manipulation, intimidation. What we know about children's development is that those kinds of experiences in our growing up not only shape what it is that we believe to be true about who we are or who we aren't, what we're deserving of, what we're not deserving of, what healthy relationships are supposed to look like, relationship is, how it is that we're supposed to resolve conflict. All of those messages are ingested. We also know, however, that experiencing or being exposed to domestic violence as a child does all sorts of other things from exacerbating medical conditions, stomach aches, headaches, ulcers, those sorts of things, affecting schoolwork, ability to concentrate, ability to sleep, increased rates of anxiety, depression, et cetera. And so often I know, I know for myself, it was the case that I felt like as long as my son wasn't being physically harmed by my partner, that ultimately he wasn't being affected. What I came to later know and understand is that in fact, uh, he was being affected in very significant ways. And so that can be a motivator for us parents um, to not only ensure that we're in, that mindful of our kids growing up in healthy and safe environments, it also ensures that as we prepare to enter into relationships where we're considering partnership and potentially having children, that we, we are able to understand the connection between how it is that we respond and react in relationship and, and what our children ingest um, in terms of the messages that they believe to be true about themselves and the world. Uh, lastly, uh, another point to, to just sort of drive home is that um, there's an absolute connection between domestic violence or relationship abuse and substance use. And so something to, to simply be mindful of that if you're in a relationship with someone who is abusing substances or you yourself are struggling with substance use or you have a friend or a family member who is struggling with substance use, we know that there is an absolute direct connection between people being under the influence when acts of domestic violence occur as well as the likelihood of substance use becoming a problem when in a relationship where there's a component of domestic violence being really significant. And we have resources, by the way, not only for relationship violence or domestic violence, we also have plentiful resources uh, in our county for those who are struggling with substance use. And so absolutely something that we, we want to ensure that you don't feel ashamed about and that whether it be for you or someone that you love and care about, we absolutely want to make sure that you're connected to those services as well uh, if you're watching with us tonight and that's something that you may be searching for or seeking after. So when we talk about relationship abuse, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, there's an absolute continuum, right? If we talk about the things that are in, in the red, and this is not, this does not indicate things that are more severe or less severe. Like I mentioned, experiencing emotional abuse or psychological abuse, threats, um, a, a partner threatening to harm themselves if you leave, um, someone who's controlling where it is that you're going, who you're friends with, uh, who you're allowed to talk to on the phone, uh, where you're allowed to shop, how long you're allowed to be gone, all of that, what you wear, all of those things might be in the green, right? When we talk about the continuum of relationship violence, but it doesn't mean that the things in the green affect us any less significantly than the things in the red. It's simply an opportunity to acknowledge that we often think about things in the red when we talk about relationship abuse, and yet there are all of these other ways in which we can be affected by relationship violence. And it's important that we have words for that because as we're thinking about our own relationships, as we're talking with our children, our siblings, our family members, our neighbors, our coworkers about relationship violence or domestic violence, same thing, I use those words interchangeably, it's really important that we have the words and the language to be able to talk about what this is. And so obviously when we talk about physical harm, right, hair pulling, spitting, um, holding a person against their will in a, in a space and not allowing them to leave the room, as well as things like punching, kicking, slapping, hair pulling, et cetera. All of those things absolutely constitute domestic violence and would fall into the red end of the continuum. And then when we talk about this whole middle section, I had mentioned a few examples earlier, right, about what might fall in the green. There are other things like 
um, monitoring location, um, not allowing you to talk to certain family members or friends uh, because they're wanting to control who it is that you have connection to, keeping you in full isolation, monitoring and managing the money that you earn, um, controlling what you're able to do with the children, uh, controlling if you're able to go to faith-based services or not. All of those things would certainly fall on the continuum of relationship abuse, as well as things like um, using the children or animals in order to threaten you, um, if you leave, I'm going to never allow you to see our children again. Or if you don't do what I'm asking, I'm going to hurt the dog. All of those things would fall on the continuum of relationship abuse. And I think it's important that not only, again, we become aware, but that ultimately, as we're in our communities and, and looking at and looking for opportunities to have safe conversations, that, that we're prepared to do that in a way that allows us to really speak to the continuum. So a couple of things that I want to just drive home in my last few minutes with you. One being that this can feel super overwhelming. We start talking about this and we feel like, oh my goodness, I don't know how to have these conversations with my children or with my brother or sister or with my parents, my friends, my coworkers. I don't know what I'm supposed to say, what I'm supposed to do. I don't know if I even want to broach the subject because what if somebody that I care about says, actually, yes, I, I think I might be in this, then what, right? And I think that, that ultimately, if there's any point that is important to drive home for me tonight, it's that when we show up empathetically, compassionately, transparently, non-judgmental, and with patience, that changes everything about a survivor's experience, right? Because often a survivor is already showing up feeling full of shame, full of judgment, full of doubt, really afraid that they're going to lose you as a friend or a family member or a coworker, that you're not going to want to talk to them again, that you're going to judge the relationship that they're in, that you're going to tell other people. And so we, when we can say, I want you to know that I'm here no matter what you decide. And I want you to know that I'm here to figure out the resources with you. I may not know, but I'm certainly willing to make some phone calls with you. I want you to know that I don't have any expectation of what you decide to do in this minute. And I'm going to continue to be your friend or family member and love you no matter where you are or what you decide to do at the end of the day, that I can imagine how difficult and challenging this must be. And that I believe you that those sorts of statements are, are really the only statements that you need to be able to walk away with this evening. And, and that ultimately is not only what allows a survivor to believe that they have the opportunity for a different life uh, and some hope attached to that, it also reminds them that they're not alone. And domestic violence breeds in isolation, right? Uh, the harm doer or the perpetrator wants us to believe that, that we are alone, that we can't survive without them, that nobody loves or cares about us other than them. And so all of those messages that I've just offered are reminders that those things just aren't true. So I want to just quickly acknowledge that um, there are lots of ways in which our body and our brain experiences trauma. And so sometimes um, we get really frustrated with ourselves or with others when we um, experience them as things like lazy or unable to respect our boundaries, unable to set boundaries for themselves. Maybe they trust everybody um, in ways that they shouldn't or they trust nobody. Um, maybe we or they have um, an inherent sense of lack of safety, even when things shouldn't seem um, unsafe. It's obvious that they're safe in this moment, or I shouldn't feel unsafe in this moment, that all of these things that you see on the screen currently are, can be, not, not necessarily will be, but can be indicators that we're experiencing the, the impacts of trauma. And so it allows us to be more patient with ourselves, more patient with the people that we love and care about, and also just an opportunity to ask some questions, right? Could the fact that that this person, he, she, or they, are showing up um, it, with the inability to make decisions for themselves or unable to recognize my boundaries or set boundaries for themselves, could it be that they're having a trauma response? And is there a way that I might show up differently if, if that's the case than if they're just ignoring me or not caring about my wants or needs or disrespecting me? And what kinds of questions might I wanna ask them in order to, to see if we can connect in this way? Do I wanna inquire about what might be going on for them? 
So again, if we go back to this idea that, um, that when we change the conversation, that that in turn is a resource in itself, I wanted to also really just take an opportunity to highlight the amount of courage that it takes for a survivor, whether it be you watching this evening or someone that you know that, that happens to come forward, that the amount of courage it takes to simply say, I think I might be in this, or I think I might need help, or I'm not sure if what I'm experiencing is relationship abuse, but I, I'm willing to talk about it, or I need to talk about it, or I have some questions. That in itself is tremendous. And we might be the only person that they've shared it with and the only person that they intend to share it with. And so the way that we show up is really, really important. And so it, it, it's an opportunity to remind ourselves that number one, our role is simply to listen not to tell them what they're supposed to do or have to do, not to decide the resources for them that they need, not to invalidate their emotions. How could you still love him or her? How could you be ambivalent about whether or not you want to leave? Of course you have to leave. Why would you be feeling guilty? There's nothing to be afraid of, right? That those sorts of statements can really undo a survivor's ability to feel safe in coming forward and also cause them to continue to question their own experience in the way in which they've often done because um, the perpetrator or harm doers desire is to ensure that they feel like they're crazy or like they don't know what they're talking about or that they can't trust their own experience. And so we want to show up as a safe and trustworthy person where we validate what they're experiencing we listen well, we ask them what they need rather than tell them what they need, and we validate all of their feelings as being normal, as making sense, as there not being anything wrong with them. And then lastly, we need to be patient. We know that it actually takes around seven times for, for, for a survivor to leave for good. That's on average. And so that means that there might be some back and forth. That means that there might be some ambivalence. That means that he, she, or they might acknowledge in the moment that there's a real problem and that they're ready. And then in the next moment, they're not. And so if we can show up as a patient resource, I'm here for you no matter what you decide. And when you're ready for resources, I'm happy to, to figure that out together. That's the greatest gift that we can give someone who's struggling. My last slide, I, I, I know that I've gone through this pretty quickly. There was a lot to cover in a pretty short period of time is that at the end of the day, connection is a solution. That as a survivor, I felt many of us feel um, disconnected, like we are unworthy of unconditional love, like we have to perform a certain way or do certain things in order to be deserving of love. And that when we don't do those things that we become undeserving. And so this idea of being a space where we say, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter what you choose, I'm here. I'm here as a friend. I'm here as a family member. I'm here as an advocate. I'm here to support you. And that you are deserving of connection no matter, and you are enough just as you are. Those messages for a survivor allows us to begin to question the story that's been created for us. And that in turn is where change happens. And so again, if we're feeling stuck and I don't know how to find the right resource or I don't know exactly what to say in this moment or as a survivor, I don't know what to do next or I'm afraid of being judged or told that I have to make a certain choice. We, we want you to know that that's not the expectation. And for those of you that love or care for someone who may be in this, that when we show up from a place of connection, ultimately all of the rest can be figured out with professionals that really know how to navigate the system and connect to advocates that can be of professional support. So really just wanna thank you and honor each of you for taking the time this evening to um, be a part of this conversation. Uh, the fact that you're choosing to show up in this way and that it's an important enough topic to really make the space for um, number one, exhibits tremendous courage um, in itself. And number two, just means so much to us um, as a part of your community who want to show up and spread this message and yet wouldn't be able to do that without people such as yourself. So really grateful that you're here tonight. And again, um, any questions um, or comments from me, please feel free to filter those through uh, Danielle. I'll make sure that she has my contact info. Take care, everybody. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jessica.
Um, that was a very informative and just that was a great presentation because it really matters about the connections that people have to provide that safety for them to really share their experience and seek out help. So thank you for that. Okay, and before we get into our panel discussion, I wanna to go to Amanda so that she can introduce herself. She was having some audio issues before. Okay, can we hear me? Yes. Great, great. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Amanda Lodebois and I'm with the County of San Diego Health and Human Services Agency. And I work with the Division of Integrative Services where we have domestic violence uh, contracts and work with providers to address the issue of domestic violence and how it affects the individual as well as the family. So I'm um, just happy to be here to share our uh, support of this wonderful event that speaks to the issues that um, our residents are facing and um, making sure that we provide more context about what our support looks like. Thank you, Amanda. And now I will give it over to Mona, who will be our moderator for tonight in our panel discussion. Great, thank you. And thank you, Jessica, that was very powerful. Um, I would like to go over to Claudia. Uh, we were talking about um, that continuum, that arrow with the continuum on um, what it looks like for domestic violence. Could you speak some to the the red flags that victims might experience when they're in a relationship? Absolutely, Mona. And this segues beautifully to what a very good friend of mine, Jessica, spoke to. I wanna begin by saying that I'm asked often, um, how can I spot an abuser? You know, I'm starting to date this person and I'm not sure and what can I do? And you can't, you know, I mean, it's just many times, as you know, the beginning of a relationship is roses and puppies and rainbows. It's beautiful. It's exciting. It's you get the butterflies in your stomach and the controlling and the, the you know, power just doesn't manifest itself right away. So there, there's no magic formula. And I know victims say, how did I not spot this? But you would have to be a mind reader or, or see the future many times because relationships don't start off as being abusive many times. Another thing that I want to add is that no two relationships are the same. Uh, there's going to be red flags but that, that may be common, but every relationship is different. And I love that Jessica coined this as domestic abuse because abuse encompass, encompasses the physical, the psychological, and the emotional abuse. And they're all part of this big umbrella of abuse that can happen. You can have an abusive relationship without ever having physical violence. So in terms of red flags, and Jessica spoke to some of these that Basically, in the end, it's about power and control. It's about, and sometimes they're masqueraded for love. For example, um, I don't want you to go out with your friends or your family members because I want you all to myself. I love you so much. Um, I don't want you to wear that. I don't want you to wear makeup because you're so beautiful to me already. Or I don't want you to work. I don't want you to go to school because I believe Claudia has Okay, well, let's try to um, <laughs> see if she'll come back to us, but she did bring up a really good um, point about in the beginning, it is all rainbows and puppies and that, and you feel like you're in love and it can catch you off guard and going into it, um, having what Jessica was talking about, having those discussions with your children ahead of time, what to look for, you know, just having that little seed planted in the back of the head, you can still be in love and experience these things, but just kind of monitor the situation as you're going along. So why don't we move on over to Delcroix? How about, um, can you tell us about the barriers that refugees face when they're seeking services? Thank you very much. So one of the biggest barriers is lack of English proficiency. 
for survivors of domestic violence is one of the barriers is not be able to speak English. I know we have two minutes each speakers. Is that true? Do we? Okay, so I try to. So yes, so not be able to speak the language, not be able to speak English is one of the biggest barrier. And familiar with the justice system, most of the you know, refugee community, they come from the country or places that domestic violence is not an issue. It's not being addressed. We don't have a definition of domestic violence. We don't have a law to protect victims of domestic violence. So that's why they are not familiar how the justice system works. Most of when we talk about refugee and immigrant, one thing it came to our mind is they come to this country with heavy backpack and we call it an invisible wind. We don't see it, but it's there. They flee their country because of religious prosecution, because of uh, some political prosecution. So they come to this country, they find safe house, but they did not find safe home. So they are, they have a lot of PTSD and they have a lot of trauma. So imagine if you don't speak English, if you don't familiar with the system, in addition to that, you have PTSD and you suffer from a depression, you know, related to war and domestic violence. It's so difficult to uh, break those barriers and, you know, try to seek some services. And mental health, do we have a good mental health system? We have a great mental health system. But is this mental health system applied to the refugee and immigrant community? No, this mental health system is for American people. It has nothing to do with the refugee community. Imagine we have a mental health system that require you have to have a, a, a medical and the medical just cover 10 session. Imagine for somebody who has lost a family member or suffer from domestic violence for 15 years, do you think 15 sessions to see a therapist with the interpreter and every time change of interpreter require a lot of trust and, and safety. So that could be a barrier also. In addition to that, it's cultural barriers. So cultural barriers could be prevent could prevent victims of domestic violence from uh, seeking domestic violence services and consider safety. For example, like uh, sexual assault in an intimate violence in some countries and culture is not considered as illegal. So those people, when they come here, they don't know this is illegal in this country. That could be a, a, a barrier. One of other barriers is cultural value. We talk about cultural barriers, but there is cultural values associated with the cultural barriers. Is you know those people they belong to the community. Their reputation is very important. They don't want people to talk to them. They don't want to disconnect with the community, and they are shaming and blaming. It's always been part of the culture, not just the immigrant culture. It's the part of the culture that we shame and blame the victim. We look at the, the law enforcement. We look at the court system. We always be in shame and blame when it comes to issues of, of, of domestic violence. Social economic isolation, especially for somebody who belong to the small community. Her community is the only one she are familiar with. It's so difficult for her to disconnect, to move to different communities. She has to move her kids. She has to move. Uh, everything that she's familiar with, especially she's depending on her husband, he's the only breadwinner. So that could be one of the, 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 the barriers. Lack of cultural competency services around San Diego, and let me tell you this, 19 years ago when I started this work, is the same thing. We have, I would like to say something. When you have a survivor of domestic violence with all of the barrier, let's say barrier, by the end, I will explain it's not a barrier with all of the barriers. And it's like you are in front of computer and you have an email with a big attachment. You have to be aware how to open this attachment. Otherwise, it contains a lot of virus that will affect your computer, that will affect all of the information. So cultural competency training, we have lack of cultural competency training around San Diego, especially for victims of domestic violence. The other thing, lack of awareness about intimate uh, violence uh, um, 
about you know, issues of domestic violence in this community. These people, they know the only way to resolve their issues is go to the imam or the priest or somebody that the family respect. And those people, it's, it depends how they are familiar with issues of domestic violence. 99% of those clients, they've been asked to go to cycle of violence. If not, they've been shamed and blamed by the faith leaders uh, in our community. Political and environmental landscape. We, the world we live now, anti-immigrant, bang on Muslim community, white supremacy movement, those all could prevent survivors of domestic violence from the refugee community, especially after September 11, when I have conversation and I have coffee sometimes with some survivors, when I ask them, what stop you? What's stopping you from seeking services? They say, you know what? I want the police to come arrest my husband as a perpetrator, but I don't want them to arrest him as a terrorist, especially after September 11, with all of the, uh, you know, stereotype about a Muslim guy, about the Arab guy. So this could be preventing uh, a lot of uh, survivors. The other thing is reporting. They're afraid to report the incident to the police. Why? They've afraid to report because most of those people, they came from the country, that they flee the country because of the police, because the police were associated with the gang member, with the tribal group, with a religious group. So those people, they cannot trust the police because they've been tortured by the hand of the police. The other thing is they are afraid because they are distrust the law enforcement. They're afraid of being deported. One of the survivors that we work with her and we try to help her, of course, we process the VAWA the application for her. When we say, what stopping, what stopped you from seeking the services? Because her husband told me if I call the police because I don't have an immigration status that I'll be subject to deportation. And there are a lot of other things that including afraid of losing their children, afraid of being deported. So those all barrier, those all could be the barrier if we decided to make it a barrier. But the reality, if we think so clearly, is that a barrier? It's not a barrier, it's a fact. It's a fact when I came to this country, with this, I was a second English language. I didn't know anything about this system. System, it wasn't the barrier, it was a fact. But when we choose to make it the barrier, when we choose to not offer services, to not offer cultural competency services, to not offer mental health services, to not address the issues, to not create a safe space for our client, for our community, when we, when the media start to attack the refugee community, showing the negative side of their country, this is when we this is the time when we decide to be barrier. Otherwise, when people say, what are the barrier? I say barrier, it's fact. So I know I have two minutes. I don't wanna talk about it a lot, but thank you very much for allowing me to speak and uh, I'm ready for any questions. All right, thank you, Doquaz. That was very informative. Um, thank you. You know, you bring up such a great point about all the different fears, I mean, just coming to this country and not being able to speak the language and the fears of being marked as a terrorist and so on and so forth. Uh, also, it's, it's all so exhausting. And anybody who's been through it knows that it is so exhausting. You're not getting sleep at night as it is. And then to have to think about a plan and how to get out is, is really challenging. So Stephanie, let's move over to you and talk about the difference between a U visa and a VAWA. Yeah, so um, it's great to go after Dil Claus because she really kind of was a segue into U visa and VAWA. Um, so uh, Dil Claus, one of the things she mentioned was that you know immigrants come here and they don't really know what services exist or that they can trust law enforcement, um, that they can report crimes when they're victims of crimes and ask for help. And that, you know, all of these amazing individuals on this panel come together to kind of allow them to have services full circle. Um, and one of them being, um, you know, immigration services for victims of crimes. Um, the U visa 
um, is for immigrants who have been victims of violent crimes, such as, um, you know, crimes against children, um, uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, um, battery. Um, there's a variety of cases. Um, but one of the very important things in the U visa is that the crime must have been reported to law enforcement and so that there is a police re report that the incident has been documented. Um, in addition, that the victim is willing to cooperate and assist law enforcement in their investigation. Um, those are all very, very important things um, because part of the U visa process is that um, law enforcement or, or the agency that was involved um, in taking the report, um, sometimes it could be the DA's office, um, different agencies um, that um, they're able to sign off and say that, you know, there was a report and that the victim was willing to cooperate um, with law enforcement in the prosecution uh, of the um, suspect, the abuser um, of the incident. Uh, whereas in VAWA, VAWA is for um, immigrants who have been um, victims of abuse um, at the hands of a U.S. citizen or legal permanent uh, resident spouse or immediate family member. Um, this could also be um, a parent who was um, a victim of abuse at the hands of a U.S. citizen child. Um, so those are the main differences where in the U visa, the abuser um, doesn't have to be um, uh, doesn't have to have legal status. Um, so those are just, you know, things that we look out for. Um, always, I always tell people, we don't say to just report a crime because it can help you to obtain legal status, but because it's so important that people get the services that they need, that they get the protection that they need, because um, you're not alone in, in, in your pain, in your suffering. There's so many people willing, all these beautiful people here today, willing to help um, and provide the services that you need. Um, and so um, back to Dilquaz, because she's always such a great uh, speaker. Um, one of the important things at ICWIC is that all of the attorneys who work at our office um, are fluent in Spanish and in English. Um, and so, the majority of my day I spend speaking in Spanish. I think if I speak English maybe once, it's very, um, very, very little. Um, it's very important that we're able to provide services in the language that our clients speak. Um, and there's so many other organizations as well in the area who are, you know, seeking, you know, to, to help individuals who speak Vietnamese, um, Chinese, you know, very many different languages and um, so yeah the, I'm happy to answer any more questions um, at the end as well. Great thank you so much Stephanie you brought up a great um, uh, point about reporting. Reporting is so important and it is a scary thing but you know sometimes the abuser is very good at causing the abused to be isolated and of course, the language barrier is a great way to isolate. So this is so awesome that that you're sharing this information of the different languages that are available to those out there. Um, let's go ahead over to Jenny and tell us what happens when someone calls a sheriff to report a domestic violence incident. Yeah, so when you report a domestic violence incident, we are showing up no matter what. And if it's an active scene, we're showing up with multiple officers because we know how unpredictable domestic violence incidents can be. They're usually highly emotional. Um, you know, it's we're not sure who called 911. We're like, like it just varies. I mean, we'll know, but it could vary. It could be um, maybe it's a, a witness like a neighbor or, you know, just a stranger that was walking by. Maybe it is a victim. Maybe the suspect's calling, right, to show that they have power and control inside of their residence. We, we've seen that several times, um, you know, to, to, to put onto their victims, to encourage that, you know, that they are in control in that situation. And I recently went out just on a detective follow-up call to a residence and immediately when we walked in the door, um, the, the person who had been previously arrested, we were just there to follow up on, he was standing there and 
immediately. He just wanted to know we will sit in this room, like all of us, like my, my wife will sit with me. We will all sit here and have this conversation. And we had to go through and explain to him that that's not how we do domestic violence investigations. We are going to separate both parties. So law enforcement shows up on scene and we're going to separate parties so that we can a, assess what's going on, see if there's any medical need because of how highly emotional it is, see and identifying what injuries may or may not be seen, especially start talking about strangulation where you might not see anything on the victim, but suddenly they've changed their clothes because they've urinated themselves or there's been other um, loss of consciousness that occurred as a result of strangulation and we're trying to identify you know what happened there and we and we look at our um, other party and, and there's defensive scratch wounds on the face so when we show up we really have to take um, the time to to listen and evaluate and determine who is that dominant aggressor because it's not just who um, who hits first, who strikes first, there's so much more that goes into that. Who is inflicting more fear into that household? Who is taking that violence to the next level? Who has escalated it? You know, and so a person's size may impact that, but not always because there are people who are five feet tall, who are very um, active in different fighting clubs and they, and they know how to hold themselves. They're in karate, they're in Oh my gosh, I can't think of the, the, the name of the one, jujitsu. You know, we have all of these who take their time to go and learn these martial arts and, and they're, you know, they could be five foot tall and, and easily overpower somebody who's six foot tall just based on their, their strength. So there's so much that goes into us determining who that dominant aggressor is inside that home and where the escalation of violence occurred. And that's what we're looking for. Um, we do live in a state where domestic violence is, considered a crime and we focus on it and it is a priority so when we show up to these scenes of domestic violence we are going we have a pro arrest policy and we are going to most likely be taking somebody to jail um, for that because it, the state wants us to make sure that we're giving cool off time that we're separating that we're able to speak to the victim giving a victim resources giving them access to all of these different advocates who can provide them resource, you know, and sometimes they don't always want that. Sometimes they may not want us there, especially if they didn't call, if they didn't call to have us on scene and, you know, they they push us away. So we get um, a tug and pull from those scenarios that we show up on and we don't need victim cooperation when we show up to a domestic violence incident, which is designed so that a victim doesn't feel the need or that she ha he or she has to say, yes, I want my abuser arrested, because that might not be reasonable in a domestic violence incident. You put emotions into this, and suddenly there's power and control going on, and your victim knows that if they are going to decide to press charges against their abuser, most likely that's they're, they're afraid. That's fearful. How are they going to go and say that, especially if they know that their abuser is going to believe that? So a lot of times we're on scene and it's, I don't want him or her arrested. I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want this. Nothing happened. But we're looking at significant injuries that occurred. And we've determined, you know, who's the dominant aggressor at that point. We are going to make the arrest with or without um, that victim's cooperation in those incidents. So especially when we have victims like that, I really praise on, on trying to give them information because law enforcement can't do it all. We show up, we, in, we enforce the law, we look for the crime and for the safety of the victims. But all these advocates, all these organizations that are out there are the ones that are really getting the safety plan of those homes. They're the ones that are getting shelters. They're the ones that are leading them in the direction that they needed to go to start making healthier decisions and get therapy services and whatever resources they may need. That's not going to be something that law enforcement is going to provide. We're going to be there to identify the abuser, to see what the victim is, to determine what's going on and scene, and moving forward with the justice system as far as arresting our abusers and then giving the information to our victims about what options they have to reach out to from that point forward. Yeah, very good. You know, you brought up about the injuries and stuff and injuries don't always show up right away, especially you don't know that you have pain because you have so much adrenaline running through your body. And then once that wears off then that pain starts kicking in and that swelling and the bruising, it, it does take time. 
So, um, Jenny, how about if uh, the person is undocumented? So in California, we are a sanctuary state, so we don't share that information. That's not something we, we don't even ask. And if I show up on a DVC and I don't even ask for, you know, are you a documented, do you have a citizenship here? That's not, that's not important to me. That's not important to me on any scene. I mean, every, every contact I've ever made as a law enforcement officer, I've never asked, you know, what's your citizenship status? That's not important to me. I'm there to investigate a crime and the state of California has made it very clear that we don't, we don't share. I don't, I don't call border patrol or department of defense or anybody and say, Hey, we got one here. That's, that's not how it is anymore. And I know maybe 15 years ago, that was a reality, but that's not, that's not today. That's not 2020. I've been on the department for, eight years and it's hasn't occurred you know i've never been trained to to ever do that regardless of our sanctuary state so if victims are undocumented and suspects are undocumented we're just there to do our part anything that has to do with their legal status we would refer to our advocates you just heard stephanie um, discuss you know what options we have for our victims um, the the only thing i could say is that an arrest is public record so that's something, if there is anything, if there was previous immigration holds, if there was previous things that were going on that may have already been documented with um, a person and, and they were arrested for domestic violence, that may be, that's public information. So we can't prevent who sees that. But other than that, there's no, um, there's no communication between law enforcement and their documentation status. Okay, great. Thanks. Good information. Um, you had brought up something about safety planning and Claudia, I want to go back to you um, talking about a little bit about safety planning, but also um, about the cycle of a DV case. And I apologize profusely of all times to have a Wi-Fi and power outage um, at my house. Oh, no. um, so, so sorry, I have now battery operated lights all around me and I'm hoping that I can get through this. Um, so, and I was saying about, you know, the red flags, like I said, every relationship is different. And not only to recognize red flags in your own relationship, but for a loved one as well. Um, as Jessica pointed out, feel free to have the conversations if you notice that um, the victim is always looking to his or her, you know, spouse for approval or for permission to speak, or if children are nervous or 80 degrees out and they're wearing long sleeves, long pants, uh, sunglasses in the middle of the night, you know, those are all the, the red flags that something is going on. Um, and if there is something going on, many victims are not ready to leave, are not ready to leave the relationship for one reason or another, whether it be financial dependence, whether it be because the isolation has gone so far, they have nowhere to turn, whether it is because of the children, regardless, and as Jessica pointed out, this is not the time to be judgmental, but help. We encourage victims to please have a safety plan, a safety plan in place in case the, the, the situation gets critical. And what do I mean by that? Some recommendations are um, make sure that if things do escalate to violence, don't run or, or don't be near anywhere where there's weapons. Uh, don't wear any necklaces or scarves or anything that can be used to strangle. Um, don't run towards the children because the children may be harmed have a packed bag, you know, if you know things can, you may have to leave right away and you have your own car, maybe have a packed bag with clothing, with toiletries, with identification, with money um, that you can just get in and go. Maybe park the car in a way that you can just get in and go. Most importantly is to teach children to get help. Uh, we, all, we often recommend have a code word uh, a code word that you know that you instruct children, neighbors, friends, families. If you utter that code word, that means please call 911 right away and, and get help because that is always critical and important as well. Um, 
Jessica mentioned, you know, the hotline, and I know the hotline is in the chat. There's always resources there um, if a victim is not ready to leave. And so if the victim is ready to leave or if 911 was called and law enforcement investigated the case and it comes to the district attorney's office. Now in San Diego County, the district attorney's office uh, basically process, uh, reviews all and issues only felony cases. The city attorney's office um, handles all misdemeanors, but that is for the city of San Diego only. In outside of the city of San Diego, the district attorney's office uh, reviews and processes both felony and misdemeanors. And what do I mean by that? A misdemeanor is a crime that is designated by our legislature to have a maximum punishment of less than a year in local custody. A felony is a crime that can still get probation and have um, less than a year in county jail, but the maximum punishment are, is prison. And so that's the, the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony. And so when a case comes into our office, uh, we act upon it right away. We don't let them sit. We don't, you know, because we know that this is critical. This is a, a person's life. This is a family. And so we review our cases and right away, Yadira will talk to you about um, a victim advocate from our office is assigned to the case Im immediately, who will then reach out um, to the victim and offer services. What we do is we receive the, um, all the investigation from law enforcement. And if we have to do follow-up, we do follow-up. I mean, to make sure that we have mo all the information we can, but first and foremost, our priority is that the victim is safe. And so making sure that that victim has a safe place to go. Uh, and so we always reach out to make sure that, that that happens first and foremost. We review the case and um, we have to be able to prove a case, ethically prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. Now that's a high burden and many times, you know, it just breaks our heart, but you know, we just can't meet that burden and we cannot file charges. And so that's when we encourage a victim to obtain restraining order, to offer services. We don't need to file a case to get services. So a victim can always get services regardless of what our decision is with the case. So once we, um, if we do file a case, then uh, the first thing is the arraignment because um, uh, a suspect has to be formally charged and that is when bail is set. So bail has, if you've seen Follow the News, has kind of been a fluid thing. Before, every crime had an attached bail schedule. Um, since COVID, however, we went to what is called a zero bail. However, domestic violence was exempted. So domestic violence still carried um, a bail amount, those charges. And so once we um, formally charge someone with charges and bail is set, then the case starts rolling. Now, things have been very different since the pandemic. As you know, the courts are closed and all of the hearings right now are being conducted remotely but we're still open. So how does that look? Basically the same thing as we are doing here. We don't use Zoom, but we use something very similar where we um, tune in, the judge has a camera, we tune into the court, um, the suspects are, do not leave the jail. So there's a camera at the jail. Um, the defense counsel appears from their office. Our DA appears from their office. And that is how um, uh, hearings have been conducted. If we do have to put on a preliminary hearing, which is for felonies to show the judge that we have enough uh, evidence to go to trial, that has been via officers only during COVID. Now, these are all uh, hearings that traditionally happen in the courthouse, as you know, um, in the courtroom. Now, when we have victims testify, that they don't just get thrown in jail and, I mean, I'm sorry, thrown in the court, um, in the witness stand and fend for themselves. We walk them through the process whole step of the way. Um, we even have court dogs to accompany children to make them feel more comfortable. Um, these are court trained dogs um, to make them feel more comfortable 
having to testify sometime against a, you know, a parent. Um, victims have a, a victim advocate with them every step of the way. And if we have to go to trial, the same thing, we are with them every step of the way. Uh, right now, because of COVID, um, we have not been doing trials since, since March, but we are starting now. So the very first trial is happening next week, um, and it's an elder abuse case. And so we're going to start with that, and then I believe there's nine um, trials now set that are going to start in our courthouse, and uh, I believe the fourth one is a domestic violence case, and I believe the ninth one is as well. Um, and so the, these are slowly starting to happen again. Um, so we can just get uh, get ourselves rolling, you know, and, and do that. Um, but I, I, with a caveat of, I, I believe about 90% of the cases resolve. And what do I mean by that? Is that we reach some sort of resolution. And the prosecution has changed a lot from when I started, you know, 17, 18 years ago. Um, before it was, okay, what's the maximum we can get? Let, let's prosecute and now we're shifting to more of a let's look at who we have you know let's look at you know our, our suspect our, our defendant is it someone that has no record but just something happened to them or they're on um you know substance abuse you know they're, they're alcoholics is it going to help throwing them in jail you know that's not going to help can we get them um help you know with their alcoholism can we get them drug treatment um, they all have to go, if they get probation, to a recovery program, learn to be a better partner. Obviously, some deserve to go to prison, and we do that, you know, especially, you know, the, just those horrible crimes we see every day against children, against, you know, just the horrific. But for the most part, now it's like, what, what can we do to, because this family's probably going to be together. So what can we do to help this family uh, live violence and abuse free? And again, we work with wonderful organizations as the panelists are now. Um, and I know just seeing firsthand, I'm bilingual and bicultural, just reaching out in my culture to someone who is Mexican, who I am, you know, in Spanish, just garners so much trust, you know, trust, and they know that you would, you know, do anything for them. And that's what we aim to do. And that's why, um, organizations such as License to Freedom are so important because you need to have that bicultural, that by bi, that language. Um, and I wish we had more of that in our office to reach out and, and make victims and survivors and suspects and defendants feel that, look, we are for you. We, we were trying to fight for you. So, you know, Claudia, you bring up a great um, point here with uh, the defendant because part of the reason why the abuser, abuser is um, acting out is because they do have some sort of an addiction or something like that and the person who is being abused loves that person so much and so for the um, the DA's office and stuff to see that person for who they are and who the potential that they can be the way the abused person sees them makes such a big difference and I think that would open up the gates for having them reach out more if they feel like that person's best interests are going to be looked at as well and that they might be getting the help too that they need to reconcile the whole family because you know you just don't want to throw away the family sometimes yes you need to uh, get that help but uh, anyway that's just just really great that you brought that up because I've never heard that before. Um, Yadira, I'd like to talk with you about the ways the DA's office assists victims, even if they don't want to report to law enforcement. Yes, hello. So we assist victims of crime regardless if a crime has been reported to law enforcement. And just like Claudia mentioned, we also assist victims regardless of the decision that has been made in our office, whether to move forward or unable to move forward with the case. We continue to work with victims. We always, you know, keep contact and we let them know, you know, regardless of the decision in our office, we're here to assist you in providing resources and we provide them with options. Victims are able to have the options and make the best decision for themselves and we respect the decisions that they make and we're not judging 
we're there to help and you know whatever decision that they make just to let them know that the doors will always be open if they have any further questions or in need of additional resources regardless of whatever decision they made we we are also able to assist if they're you know if they call us and they're, they're still with their abuser they just want resources maybe they want the hotline number maybe they're not aware of the services that are out there and we provide the information and resources that they need at the time and just let them know that you know in the future if they have any questions we're always there to help um, some of the services that the victim assistance program provides at the DA's office we do a lot of crisis intervention services. We assess current and future needs because we know those change over time. We do a lot of safety planning. We provide options and resources and referrals to community um, agencies. We're also able to provide emergency assistance, which include food and shelter. Our role is also to assist with the California Victim Compensation Program, and victims are able to apply um, for some of the following benefits um, that could potentially be any, any expenses that might have um, occurred during a crime, such as medical or dental expenses, relocation in situations such as domestic violence, sometimes victims need to relocate. We can assist with relocation and also emergency relocation. Um, mental health treatment for therapy and um, home security improvements. Those are only some of the benefits through the California Victim Compensation Board, but we're able to assist them every step of the way to be able to help them submit an application. Another role of the victim advocate at the district attorney's office is to provide support throughout the criminal case. So like Clyda mentioned, we're there from the beginning all the way to the end and even sometimes beyond victims have questions and have needs and we're happy to assist. We provide accompaniment to deputy district attorney and law enforcement interviews. We provide orientation to the criminal justice system because we know that the criminal justice system can be very complex and complicated and we're there every step of the way and we explain, for example, you know, what's an, what's an arraignment, what does that mean, what are, you know, sometimes court dates might change, and just make sure that, you know, every step of the way that we're there to be able to provide updates and, and be able to connect with the deputy district attorney as well, you know, if there's any concerns that arise due to the case, so we're able to communicate within, um, you know, with the DD, DDA on the case as well. We provide case status information. We also provide court accompaniment, um, court support to victims, family, and friends. We can assist with a victim impact statement and also with restitution. Um, and again, we're there to provide services, um, whether there's an issued case or non-issued case in our office. And there's advocates throughout the county for res for support and also we do have Spanish speaking advocates available. Thank you. Great, thank you, Yadira. Um, you brought up a good thing that says here about how they can keep coming back to you. And Jessica in her presentation was talking how it takes up to seven times sometimes for a person to leave their abuser. And each time they come back to you, they're getting more information and then they're building that courage to leave. So uh, it's, it's so great that you've shared that information. So we'd like to go over to Carla here and um, we want to know about the VA support and how they support the veterans and the spouse of, of the veterans in a domestic violence situation. Um, yeah, hi. Uh well, our program, the Intimate Partner Violence Assistance Program, um, helps with both veterans who are engaging in violence as well as veterans who are experiencing violence in their relationship. And veterans are twice as likely to experience violence in a relationship than the general public. Um, they're not exactly sure why that is. There's certain factors that um, they're looking into as possibilities. I mean, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is is among one of the top ones they're researching. Um, just the military family life and stressors, um, separation and isolation from family. Um, but 
as far as services, so we are a healthcare provider. So one positive about that is we are seeing this person more regularly. So um, uh, generally it might be the doctor who might have a suspicion um, that there might be some IPD going on. However, we now that we have the Intimate Partner Violence Assistance Program, which is now national, uh, we have created a, a assessment tool. So the doctor, the social worker, the mental health provider, um, even uh, the LVN or RN can do this screen. So uh, my goal though is to have the screen become a mandatory screen that is done yearly. And some VAs are doing that. I will begin a pilot program uh, with the Women's Health Clinic where we are gonna screen at 100%. So that, that's probably really positive, move in the right direction. So. If someone does screen positive, uh, then they um, would do a, depending on how, what, how, depending on um, how they screen determines whether uh, we would uh, pursue safety planning. And this is all if the veteran is willing. So then we would complete a safety plan. We would assist with um, providing resources, hopefully, um, uh, community resources and um, ha uh, depending on if they're you know willing to whether they want to stay or leave and we even have safety plans um, that we provide that I provide that there's a safety plan for staying there's a safety plan if you're leaving um, the safety plan we try and not um, make the provider you know follow too many you know I mean I allow the provider to just put the safety plan right in the medical note but also that being said, we are very mindful of um, whether this, you know, the spouse or partner has access to their medical file, which a lot of this, now there is a lot more um, cyber questions that you have to ask. So we always ask um, if, the, if the partner might have their PIN number or have access to their My Healthy Vet. Um, I, I try to document everything, um, even when I document a note, it just says social work, it doesn't say IPV, I don't have IPV on my phone. Uh, so we do a lot of things to sort of maintain safety. Uh, as far as if, if it is a spouse or non-veteran or partner, um, we will not document in the veterans chart, but we'll create what's called a collateral chart. Uh, which is a chart with the spouse or partner's name uh, and their information that the veteran has no access to, does not even know exists. So uh, that is a safety measure. However, we try, if it's the non-veteran, uh, because we are a healthcare setting and we are, that is our job is to provide healthcare to the veteran, we try and get them transferred to the community as quickly as possible and really get them comfortable reaching out to community providers. A lot of times we might do a three-way call where we stay on the line and get them, you know, connected with the Family Justice Center or, you know, so that they, because um, sometimes they have not made any calls. They, we are the first person they've communicated with. And a lot of times it can be them grabbing a doctor, you know, while they're, that while the veteran is being seen or they might, you know, approach someone in the ER while the veteran is being seen by the doctor. So, so, so you have to be very careful in those situations. But so those are some of the things we're doing with the VA. It, it is, um, you know, it's, it's new to the VA. It's so uh, a lot of it is just creating awareness, making providers feel comfortable asking and knowing that if they ask, that there's someone there to help them. So that's sort of my job, which um, uh, can be frustrating. <laughs> and uh, every VA is a little different. Um, and, but, but I feel like in the two years that we've had this program, we are making progress. And uh, I'm just so, I'm so appreciative that I've been included in this uh, discussion and thank you. And uh, please reach out um, and, and always, Always remember to ask if someone's a veteran, because 
A veteran just means that they served in the military. It doesn't mean they have to have served in a combat situation. It just means that they served in the military. And, and you can go from there. So if, if you have someone, just always try to remember to ask if they're a veteran. Because a lot of, a lot of veterans don't know that they're eligible for care. And um, they really don't. So it's, it's always good to ask. And thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Carla. You know, that's so important that you brought that up because I did not realize I was eligible for care. Mm -hmm. And my mom happened to have a conversation with somebody who told her, have, have your daughter file for, file a claim with the VA. And sure enough, I, I qualified. And that was part of my escape plan was, hey. was doing that. And so the VA has been in my back pocket since uh, 1999. Yeah. And so I thank you so much for all your help with that. Sure, yeah, um, and I'm so glad you, you found that out. A lot mm -hmm. of people just don't realize. Yeah, they don't realize, that's for sure. So hopefully we can get that word out. So finally, let's go to um, Amanda here. We wanna talk about the children and the children who witnessed or are exposed to domestic violence. In Jill's presentation, she said that 10 million children are exposed every year. So what can you tell us about that? So um, the county has a strong commitment to address domestic violence. We know that it's a larger issue in our society and the Division of Integrated Services holds contracts throughout the region of San Diego. So knowing that it's not an isolated situation in any part of our county, that domestic violence can flourish anywhere. We want to um, always ensure that there is a safe place for families to go, for victims of domestic violence to go. And we know that um, the uh, concerns around the domestic violence are not just with that, the one person that is affected, it's also with the children, the families. So um, making sure that not only do we have, are we working with partners through contracts, um, but we work with those partners to provide shelter beds and wraparound care services. So knowing that it doesn't just stop with um, having an available bed, but also what does that case management look like? Are there services that can support uh, victims in uh, regaining their life and stability and safety back? So the contractors that we work with provide uh, services that include transportation, that, that includes um, access to food, that includes medical and, and uh, mental health services. That's a big part of um, some of the impact that domestic violence victims um, are dealing with. Also, the concerns that parents may have about uh, getting their children connected back into school. So a lot of those things that may keep um, victims bound to a, a um, dangerous situation, we work with providers that, that recognize that and recognize the importance of looking at all those different aspects of their lives that are impacted by domestic violence and how can they break down some of those barriers and recognizing that children um, often are in the midst uh, between parents and, and, and seeing that violence. So knowing that not only does that care uh, is, is needed for, for their parent, but uh, the care is also needed for them and helping them to gain that, that sense of safety uh, that will allow them to, to thrive and work through some of those things that they face uh, while being impacted by violence. Great, thank you so much. So um, I just want to go ahead and um, check in with Danielle here and check in on our time. Yes, so we did go over, we only have two minutes left, but it's not like we went over talking about nothing. People were getting out some really good information to the community right now. Um, so we will not have time to go over the questions that were asked. But I, I have put uh, the Care Resource Fair email address in the chat box, the general chat box, for those of you who have questions that you might not have wanted to share in public. Um, this can also be uh, uh, sent to you. The recording of this can be sent to you. Just email the Care Center's uh, email address and we can get that to you. And it will also be post, posted on the DA's YouTube page. But before we leave today, well, first, I want to thank all the panelists today for giving us that great information. Um, I learned a lot today, and I'm sure that everyone in the audience also learned a lot today. And then I want to get into the raffle for the $25 gift card. 
I've already put everyone's name in there that is in attendance. So I will, I have my little bowl here with your names in there. So, so we have the winner is Jessica, Jessica W. I don't want to butcher your last name, Jessica. Um, and Jessica is here today. And we have your email address, Jessica, because you did, um, you did uh, register through the registration link. So we'll be emailing you so we find out where you want us to send um, your $25 gift certificate. Um, and so that we're cognizant of everyone's time, I wanna say thank you again to all the panelists here today. Um, and I wanna say thank you also to those who have attended today to take in this information. Please pass it on. Um, Please go to our Facebook page also to get more information and more resources that are available for domestic violence and breast cancer awareness survivors. And we'll be having more uh, of these workshops and panels throughout the month in English and in Spanish. So again, I wanna thank everyone for coming here today and I hope everyone has a great week and a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm.